Now on Indianapolis This Week, the race for U.S. Senate, our Sunday morning exclusive with the first Democrat to officially enter the race, plus the fight over the city's electric vehicle fleet and the contract to pay for them. The mayor weighs in and why the controversy is now likely heading to court. And Glenda for governor, the big question surrounding the new candidate, can she win? From RTD6, the Indie Channel. This is Indianapolis This Week with Rafael Sanchez. Thank you for joining us for Indianapolis This Week. You can join us on Twitter right now on your smartphone or your tablet and join the debate as it happens. Just look for our new Twitter account, at Indy This Week. We start with the race for U.S. Senate, where we can officially add that Baron Hill's name to the list of candidates the first Democrat to formally file for the race. He made the announcement Wednesday, including a statement posted online that says, we face a crisis today as a people and as a nation. For too long, working people across America have been counted out and left out of our economic progress. It goes on to say we can either put our hands in the sand or we can fight to restore the American dream, the middle class, and what's great about Indiana. Uh, joining us now, Baron Hill, the newly declared Senate candidate. He served five terms in the U.S. House of Representatives and another eight years in the Indiana House. Welcome to the program. The last time you were here, you were talking about a possible gubernatorial run. Now you're going to run for the U.S. Senate. Why the change? Uh, I was interested in running for governor, uh, uh, but I never dismissed the idea of running for the United States Senate. Um, uh, it's a body that can get things done, and so uh, I never actually eliminated that possibility. When the Senate seat uh, opened up uh, because uh, uh, Senator Dan Coach decided not to run for the United States Senate, I thought that uh, there's an opportunity for me to serve the people of Indiana in a way that I would like to serve them. So let's talk about that. When you announced that you were running for this seat, you talked about a crisis in our state and in our country. What is that crisis? Yeah, you know, the economy has snapped back from 2008, Raphael. Uh, but job numbers last month were way high. We're above yes, expectations, yes, right? Yes, yeah, and it, it, we're, we're, the, the job market is growing. What's not growing are wages. Uh, I was in uh, Columbus, Indiana here about three weeks ago and I uh, gave a speech there and it was all about the wage gap that has occurred since the re Great Recession of 2008 and several people came up to me and one guy in particular told me that he was making $40,000 10 years ago now he's making $23,000 and he doesn't see any hope of him getting back to that $40,000 range. You know, there's always been hope in this country that you know you're going you're to have a better life somewhere down the line either for yourself or for your children. And I've sensed as I've traveled the state that there's a real uh, despair going on with uh, income wages. They say that government does not create jobs unless it's an infrastructure job, or, uh, but the, pri the private sector does. So what will you want to do to spur economic activity? What will you want to do to get those uh, middle income jobs up? Well, there's a, a several things that, that I want to look at. Uh, number one, I would be in, a, um, in favor of raising the minimum wage to a higher level. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a transportation bill uh, in Congress that is not being uh, funded like it should be. Matter of fact, I was talking to a road contractor today who was telling me, Baron, our roads are falling apart and w there are good paying jobs that we can create if we'll do a better job at funding the transportation system in this country. So that's a, a number two thing that you can do. The, the third thing that we need to do is we need to monitor what uh, executives of large corporations are making versus what they're paying their workers. The gap between what a CEO is making and what they're paying their workers is huge. That exposure, I think, maybe will lend some pressure to these uh, corporate executive officers to just do a better job of paying their employees. So how do you push that, though? Because, you, again, you have to leg can you legislate that? You can't legislate that, but you can expose it. And as a United States senator, you're a, in a, a high-profile position where you can expose these, this big wage gap between what the upper class and the corporations are making and what the workers are making. Let's talk about some big domestic and international issues. On the domestic side, the Affordable Care Act, the Supreme Court may rule on that in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Does the Affordable Care Act have to change? Does, does that have to be fixed or is that okay the way it is? Well, if the, the Supreme Court comes down uh, not on the side of people who are getting the subsidies, in other words, if they eliminate those subsidies, that's going to create a real hardship for millions of people. That has to be fixed. 
and uh, but it can only be fixed at the at the state level primarily and now we can do some fixes at the federal level uh, but the, the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, Medicaid ex expansion is not something that we can mandate to the states so it's going to be very difficult to fix it at the federal level but I hope the Supreme Court will rule on the side of everyday people who are struggling to make a living like we were talking about before and allow those subsidies to be uh, kept in place. On the issue of terrorism, we're seeing around the country young people talking about joining ISIL. Uh, do we have to send back uh, U.S. troops to no, the Middle East? No, we don't. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was talking to Lee Hamilton just yesterday. I had lunch with him. Lee Hamilton was a member of Congress for 34 years and a foreign policy expert. And I asked him this very question, uh, should we be sending troops in uh, to fight ISIL? He said, no, what we need to be doing is what we're doing. We need to recognize that ISIL is a threat to the Middle East. It's not really uh, a threat to the United States that we know of right now. Uh, sending in drones and doing the monitoring over there, uh, making sure that they're held down. In the final analysis, the people of Iraq and in other places in the Middle East, they have to solve their problems. We could, should help them, but we should help them in, in, in terms of uh, uh, inviting our allies in Europe and other places around the world to assist as well. We should not be doing this by ourselves. Baron Hill, thank you so much. Good luck with thank your you. campaign. We'll follow okay. your campaign and, of course, the campaign of your fellow Republicans. Thank you for your time and come back anytime. I'll be happy to. Thank Thank you, sir. There are two Republicans seeking their party's nomination for U.S. Senate. Current 3rd District Congressman Marlon Stutzman and former Dan Coates Chief of Staff Eric Holcomb. Mr. Holcomb will join us next week right here on Indianapolis This Week. Coming up, a deal designed to revolutionize the Indianapolis city fleet with electric cars. But it started more of a civil war in city government. The fight over the Freedom Fleet next on Indianapolis This Week. Welcome back to Indianapolis this week. We turn now to that growing fight over the contract for new electric vehicles for the city of Indianapolis. That contract is with the Vision Fleet to provide vehicles to replace the city's aging fleet. Now, we talked about it last week on this program, a deal now shrouded in controversy over how the city came to that agreement. Last week, we talked one-on-one -on -one with the company's CEO. We do feel that city council absolutely should be engaged in this process, not necessarily from a legal perspective, but just from an engagement perspective. We, we absolutely think this is a program that everybody should be involved with and proud of, and that includes the council and the mayor's office. So we've been reaching out to council for two months to help work with them to understand their concerns and see how we can knock those down. And let me tell you, every problem that's been identified to date, we've already found a solution for. It may be hard to tell that based on the discussion that exploded on our Indianapolis This Week Twitter account after that interview aired, with Vision Fleet's CEO sparring with two members of the City County Council. The discussion claimed claims that the laws were broken and allegations of defamation. Let's turn now to New Indianapolis This Week correspondent Jason Fechner with Council Member Zach Adamson. City County Councilor Zach Adamson joining us on Indianapolis This Week. Thanks for stopping by today, Zach. Thanks for having me. Mayor Ballard has referred to this deal, the legal work behind it, as sloppy in this Twitter debate that we've had going on with Indianapolis this week, all week long. Your fellow counselor, Frank Mascari, referred to something possibly illegal taking place. Do you think something illegal has happened in terms of this deal? Well, I think there, there are some clear indications that uh, the, the law, both local city law and state laws, have been violated. Uh, and these laws are the ones that are in place to protect the assets of the people so that no one person has complete unfettered access to the resources of the people I, and I think those are the laws that have been broken let's talk about the idea behind this deal and transitioning out the current fleet for electric vehicles this is actually something that you say you support yeah absolutely in in 2013 when uh, the mayor announced uh, this initiative uh, of his in his state of the city address uh, I actually approached him and told him that uh, this was something that I supported as well and to count me as an ally uh, as he moved forward with this project we spoke with Vision Fleet CEO Michael Brylowski earlier this week and he is uh, hoping that something can be done to keep this deal in place and the politics can be put aside and he can kind of be pushed out of the deal. Can this deal still be saved without legal action taking place? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't really know. Again, uh, the uh, the overarching theme here is that just because this is a, uh, an idea or a principle or a, a theory that we support, do we allow illegal activities to continue? I think it's important that we hold our elected officials accountable uh, when they violate the law. Now, 
uh, hopefully we can come to some sort of an agreement at some point on a program, if not this one, then one similar to this, uh, that does allow us to uh, uh, convert our fleet of, of gasoline-fired cars to electric-fired cars, uh, but it may not even be similar in that we're converting them all at the same time, which is, which is what this program does, rather than allowing us to age out the fleet, and as they, they're replaced, then we replace them with the more efficient electric vehicles. What about any concerns right now in the City County Council that if you avoid this deal, you're setting this entire program and the idea behind the program back years, if not longer. I don't think that's necessarily the case at all. I think there is definitely a will. I mean, uh, Mayor Ballard is a Republican. We have a Democratic majority on the council now, and I think the will uh, to do this is there. Uh, Mayor Ballard's priority is to get the city off foreign oil, which I support. But uh, even uh, the greater issue, too, is our air quality here in Indianapolis. Uh, and, and reducing the, the gas-fired vehicles in our city is, is something I think has a bipartisan support. So I see no reason why this can't be a, an idea that moves forward, even if not in this current rendition. Where does this deal go from here this coming week? Well, I think the first thing we decide is if uh, we, as the uh, the city's fiscal body, the city council, uh, believe that there is enough evidence to take this to court uh, to hold the mayor accountable for violating various uh, both city and state laws. I think that's the very first step. Uh, and after that, once we decide that, and then we decide whether or not uh, if this contract could be one of two things. It could be uh, avoidable contract and then the council has to decide if we as a stakeholder uh, think it should be voided um, or if the contract is void meaning that it never existed in the first place because of those violations because the proper procedures weren't followed uh, and I think that's uh, those are questions that we have to get to but I think it's difficult because of the political atmosphere that we're in right now uh, to do that among ourselves and that's why uh, occasionally you have to bring in the uh, the third branch of government to settle those disputes and a final last question for you today Zach if this deal is voided, could the city work with Vision Fleet again on a different deal? I see no reason why why we couldn't work with them. But again, one of the one of the uh, conflicts that we have in this process is that there wasn't a bidding process. So, provided obviously that uh, Vision Fleet is the company that can give the city the best deal uh, on this, I see no reason why we couldn't continue to work with them. Uh, much of what's been discussed about this has very little to do with them, and 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 primarily to do with the uh, the mayor's uh, disregard for checks and balance. Councilor Zach Adamson, thank. You. For joining us thank on you Indianapolis this week, Raphael. A story that will continue to follow. Follow. Thank you, Jason. Uh, coming up, it's official. Glenda Ritz in the race for governor. Our insiders on the big questions surrounding her campaign and asking, can she win? Welcome back to Indianapolis this week. Let's talk about the race for governor. And of course, a new candidate officially in the race this week. And Democrat Glenda Ritz formally announcing Thursday that she will seek the Democratic nomination for governor. The current superintendent of public construction playing heavily on the theme of education and the economy in her announcement. Our State House reporter Katie Hines has much more. State School Superintendent Glenda Ritz says she is the best person to beat Governor Mike Pence in the race for governor in 2016. She says her experience extends beyond education and she plans to show it. Ritz is the third Democrat to join the race after former House Speaker John Gregg and State Senator Karen Tallian. But the director of the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics argues Pence is the person who could benefit most from a growing Democratic primary field. That's because those candidates will have to differentiate themselves from one another ahead of the primary, likely pointing out limitations. And that's information that Pence and the Republican Party could then later use. And a contentious primary could also leave the Democratic nominee cash strapped in the final months leading up to the general election. Raphael. Thank you, Katie. We made several offers to Glenda Ritz and her campaign to appear on the program, but her campaign declined all of them. So let's bring in the RTV6 political insiders, Lara Beck and Abdul Hakim Shabazz. Glenda Ritz, can she win? Is she the candidate for the Democratic Party? Well, if she wants to be a candidate, she wants to be a serious candidate, she's going to have to appear on programs like this and actually answer tough questions. And she has appeared in the past yeah. as superintendent yeah. of but, but governor's a, a whole new ball of wax, and she's going to have to answer a lot of tough questions. What are your position on road funding? What's your position on some of the social issues, guns, same-sex marriage, and about her own record? For example, when you were on the state uh, teachers' union board, what was your role, or did you ask any questions about the big health care scandal that defrauded a bunch of schools out of millions of 
of dollars. What about your own campaign from the superintendent at your $37,000 in debt? You've done some homework this week. <laughs> just, just, he, just, he just is, a little bit. He did a limited internet search, apparently. Yeah, um, imagine what I would do with the whole internet search. Well, I, I, you know, I think that Mike Pence clearly is vulnerable. Um, there are three Democrats who have announced that they are they are running, um, and I think what's going to be really interesting as we move forward is uh, not a lot of us love primary campaigns, um, but this is an opportunity for the three Democrats who are running really to talk about their vision for Indiana. Uh, Glenda Ritz, uh, with her announcement, has an opportunity to really activate and continue to motivate this grassroots base that we've seen her have. The challenge for her will be moving from ed being solely focused on education to tying that role in education to other state-related issues such as jobs and the economy, which she did a little bit of yes, at, at her announcement. When John Gregg was on this program, I sensed that he was concerned that while he wanted a, a, a robust primary, that he really would have preferred uh, for Glenda to run, Ms. Ritz to run as school's chief, not as his opponent uh, in a primary. Well, John Gregg isn't alone because the union sent out an email this week saying they wanted that exact same thing because they don't trust uh, Ms. Ritz's husband, who has a construction company that they believe you know, hires only non-union labor. So they're talking about a Greg t uh, Karen Tallian, uh type ticket. So, I mean, there's this whole thing about Glenda Ritz has all the support out there. You know, it's few and far between. Like we said earlier this week, apart from you know her sort of you know children of the core and ask you know, David Koresh followers that follow her all around. That's a little no, extreme. No, but once, no, but once, no, but once you get out of that bailiwick, the, the support isn't there. She only had 40 people show up at her announcement in Fort Wayne. Karen Talley had more than that. And, and she's not considered a major candidate. I think when you talk, though, about primaries, um, and I think the Republicans are going to face the same the same issue with the Senate primary, um, they, if they are divisive, uh, they can really take away, uh, especially in terms of money. You know, you need to have so much money to get in. And when you're running against someone who's not being challenged in a primary, uh, it can make things a little more complicated. But at the same time, this is an opportunity for the Democratic Party to have a very healthy discussion about where we're going in the future. And Mike Pence is clearly vulnerable, and I think Mike Pence knows that. Let's take a drive with the Vision Fleet. The other big issue for the city of Indianapolis is whether the city will, what will happen to the contract with Vision Fleet? Right now we're seeing a lot of controversy with this. Is this all just political warfare? We have a mayor that will not be coming back. And well, it's interesting because the council last year approved uh, the public works funding for Vision Fleet. They did it. Uh, we had a, some problems with themselves. We had to move some money around, and some money got moved back and forth at the, at the mayor's <laughs> office. I like how you explain uh, it. Sure. We had some problems. We had to move some money around. Yeah, they did. Know, yeah, because of, yeah, because of all the snow funding. and all the public works and oh, the snow that we on. had is, is what come the problem on. was. I'm not buying that. I, I think that Councillor Adamson did a terrific job uh, explaining some of the different issues that, that the Democrats are seeing with this. Um, I don't. I wouldn't necessarily say it's political warfare. I think it's what happened when you ha happens when you have balanced government uh, that one party asks the other party questions about what they're doing and why. Uh, I think that if it were a political issue, I, I think calling it a political issue, uh, it's not as much of it because I think if. Mayor Ballard were running again, then it would be made into much, much so more. What did the mayor very say? Valid so let's see what the mayor had to say about this. Uh, the Vision Fleet program works. I mean, there's no question it works. We made a couple of mistakes on implementation of it, but, uh, you know, nothing malicious. But the fact is the program works. We're saving $1,300 per car annually is our estimate. Uh, that's, you know, when you multiply that by hundreds of cars, that's a, that's a big number. And, and the Vision Fleet has been tremendous on it. So I talked to him on Friday about that, but also talked to him about the other big issue coming up this week, the Criminal Justice Center. Will the mayor get that? I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure. I mean, the, the new proposal is you know, scaled back. There are a few hundred more, few, few hundred fewer jail beds, uh, more emphasis on reentry and uh, helping ex-offenders, which is what a lot of people wanted. But apparently now the sheriff has got complaints. The courts you know, have complaints. The thing is, what's going to happen is this, this isn't going to go through. And when this comes back next year, whether it's Mayor Hogshead or Brewer, we're going to have this going to be well, a lot more expensive. Well, Demo well, I Democrats? think one of the challenges with this is we need it. But the way this has been done and the way now they now they were going to try and piece meal something together in a last-ditch effort. I, I don't think that's possible. I think it's probably going to get moved down the road, um, and we'll see what happens. It costs a lot more money. Uh, I don't know about that, but we'll see. The governor sent a letter to the folks, the organizers of Indy Pride, and of course he's getting criticism from his base, uh, the, uh, the Indiana Family Association. Already uh, Micah Clark saying that, of course, he shouldn't have done that. Let's listen to the governor to see if, in fact, they've mended fences after that letter. Have you spoken to Micah Clark, sir? He wrote a letter after you wrote your letter to the Indy Pride. Have you spoken to him to mend that bridge, or will you do that at a later point? Oh, you know, we have not. I, I have great respect for for uh, 
uh, the various opinions that people express uh, throughout the public debate. And uh, but uh, you know we, uh, we we're here to serve all the people of Indiana. And the agenda that we'll be articulating in the next couple of weeks as we announce our re-election is going to be one that's designed on on focusing on jobs, on education, on keeping Indiana moving forward. We're really is now being recognized around the country and around the world, leading a leading a revival in manufacturing in this country, and, and it's all because of the policies that we've been putting in place in recent years. We look forward to continuing to build on that and tell that story, and uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, can the governor in any way remove himself from the issue of RIFRA? No, he can't. And what's funny is, is you know, he's doing the classic uh, try to answer the question and then immediately pivot to talking about what you want to talk to. You tell your clients to do it, I right? do. <laughs> and, and, but with him, it doesn't come across as sincere right now because of the way he behaved over RIFRA, I think, really showed who he is and what's he's, what he's about. You get the last word. First of all, somebody needs to tell Michael Clark some days a cigar is just a cigar. The governor issues letters to organizations all the time. It was saying, a very lukewarm saying, letter, saying, well, yeah, But it was just like any other standard letter. Number two, Mike Pence has two things working in his favor. He will have time and he will have a ton of money that they're going to announce in a couple of weeks yeah, yeah, that, will help help that will help mitigate the message and mitigate the roof for damage. I, I think she, I think she just gave you that face, which means that I this discussion is over. You can <laughs> always join the discussion with our insiders on Twitter. Follow Mary Beth, Lara, Abdul, Dan, and Jennifer and stay in the know throughout the week. You can also follow our new Twitter account at Indy This Week and stay up to date on politics 24-7. Indianapolis This Week continues right after this. Storm Team 6 meteorologist Kyle Mouse with a check of your forecast going through this afternoon. We're turning up the heat and the humidity. 87 in Indianapolis, around 90 degrees for you. Bloomington into Terre Haute. Of course, we are focused on the severe weather potential as we get into this evening and tonight. Enhanced risk of severe storms. Indianapolis, I-70 areas to the north, a slight risk. Bloomington to Greensburg. And what are we going to be watching for? Well, the possibility of some damaging winds as well as some heavy rainfall, even in isolated tornado possible. That line of storms getting into areas like Lafayette and Logansport mainly after 8 o'clock this evening and then arriving in Indianapolis between 11 o'clock tonight and 1 o'clock in the morning. Here's a look at TrueCast. You can see that line of storms diving to the south as we get to around 9 o'clock in the evening and we will continue with those thunderstorms through the overnight with some locally heavy rain. We'll start off our Monday with areas of rain and temperatures near 70. A big honor for the Reverend Charles Harrison. As you can see, he received the Sagamore of the Wabash from the governor on Friday. That's the highest distinction a Hoosier can receive. And Harrison received the award for his efforts in preventing violence throughout the city of Indianapolis through the group, the Ten Point Coalition. On behalf of my colleagues, Katie Hines and Jason Fechner, thank you for joining us and have a great Sunday.